we are on the session envisioning ourselves as future ancestors with June Jamake K Smith uh, K Swift. Sorry about that. Um, I am Aparna Sinha, an assistant professor of culture and communication at CSU Maritime. Uh, I am also one of the tri chairs of the conference. Uh, I'm here in my blue colored shirt, uh, which has flowers in my cat eye glasses, um, in my mocha colored body today. Um, and before we start, we will do a land acknowledgement. So let me read the land acknowledgement. We want to acknowledge that we gather as the California Faculty Association on the traditional land of the indigenous people past and present and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. This calls us to commit to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land we inhabit as well. To recognize the land is an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory we reside on and a way of honoring the indigenous people who have been living and working on the land from time immemorial. It is important to understand the long standing history that has brought us to reside on that land and to seek to understand our place within that history. Land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or a historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. Acknowledging the land is an important indigenous protocol that we are honoring here today. I live on the land of Nisenan people, which is now called Sacramento. Okay, so today we have a wonderful session and a, and a wonderful speaker with us. And before I introduce, I just wanna quickly remind everyone, our themes that are guiding our conversation for today um, are envisioning radically different futures and care and healing. Um, so June Kayswith, also known as Juma K, uh, is a professional artist, wellness consultant and storytelling coach, which you will see in a second. After spending her 20s as an artist and community organizer inside of nonprofit organizations, she began craving an alternative narrative to healing and justice beyond the struggle. Curiosity led her back to Thailand where she studied with a traditional midwife to learn the ways of her ancestors. That's when she realized that all of our ancestors were entrepreneurial, filling a need in the community through their sacred offering. Thus sparked her calling to assist others in remembering their magic. So, and she also has a podcast called Your Story Medicine that invites listeners to challenge the pathways towards liberation and healing. Um, so please welcome June, um, uh, K. Smith. K. Smith. It's okay. Uh, you know what? Why is my last name spelled incorrectly on here? Oh, maybe because I didn't do it. It's actually K. A. E. W. S. I. T. H. Okay. No worries, because I'm pretty sure I'm in good company with other people who uh, whose names have been mispronounced throughout their lives, and so we all get to learn together. <laughs> So uh, Juma K is actually a combination of my first, middle, and last name. And so maybe you can have fun with your own name of, of um, like taking the first two to three letters of your first, middle, and last name and putting them together. And it was actually my name back from when I was, um, I, I was an artist, I was a spoken word artist, an MC. And so it's just so amazing to hear that bio, considering how far I've come, because never in my life did I imagine that I would have the privilege of being able to speak to change makers like you for this summit topic that I wish I had when I was in in higher education and when I was working in the nonprofit industrial complex. So I want to thank you all for choosing to come here today. And um, I am currently wearing, I, I've been feeling blue lately. <laughs> 
um, I've become very intimate with both my grief and my joy. And so this is my way of playing dress up with uh, my grief and be like, okay, let, let's go out for a day. And these bright earrings are from a company called Mother Sierra that is, um, that is a social enterprise providing jobs for indigenous women in, uh, um, in uh, where is it, in, in, in Mexico. So I would love for this to be as interactive as possible. I would love for this to feel like a conversation. So if there's anything I share from today that lights you up or that you resonate with, use the chat, the chat box as an energy bank. And so one of the things that I absolutely love to do is uh, first call in an ancestor. And so if you can dedicate this journey to somebody who has transitioned or maybe hasn't transitioned, it doesn't even have to be a person, by the way. Um, it could be a deity. It could be an element of nature that you're calling in. So, um, and, and also I, I have another prompt for you, which is I would love to hear where is it that your ancestors are from without you telling me where they're from? What does that mean exactly? And so I'll give an example. The ancestor that I am calling into this space today hmm, is my uh, great grandmother, who I have never known. Uh, and I'll go in, into a little bit of my story medicine of how I came to know her so intimately. She was actually the village midwife in uh, my mom's hometown. And my mother would apparently assist her with births when she was a little girl. And so I feel her so closely in my path today. And so I call her in. She is who, one of the, the people I'm dedicating this journey to. And my ancestors are from the land of smiles uh, where you can see lotus, lotuses, thousands of lotuses that just like bloom uh, from as far out as the eye can see. And um, I was raised on both McDonald's as well as stir fry noodles, which in the United States, a lot of people know as patsiu or pad thai. And so that is one way I love to call in our ancestors prior to colonization. How is it that we related to them? Through the foods that we ate, through the songs that we sang. And if you don't know where your ancestors are from, your ancestors go beyond just blood lineage. They also include your chosen ancestors. And so um, just in, in the chat, I would love it if anybody feels called to do so. Everything is an invitation. Uh, if you can call on an ancestor that has guided you thus far on this journey or who you would like to cultivate a deeper relationship with, who would that be? And then also if any of our, uh, our, our moderators are feeling called to share, you're welcome to as well. Do you want us to write them in chat? Yes, yes, please put it in the chat. For others, please use your Q&A to comment and, and reflections. Oh, okay. I don't know if I'm gonna see any. Um, all right, so as that is happening, oh, I love this. Sharon says, calling in my granny Cleo, also my great grandmother and a midwife from a tiny place where you might may find mango and coconut living off the sea. Mm, doesn't that just feel so much more visceral in the body than saying my ancestors are from, I don't know the, the literal names of the land that your ancestors are from, um, but I would invite everybody to do this, even if you have a journal, to write this down, because everything begins with an intention, and already as we are doing this, we are, we are invoking them 
into the space, acknowledging that the stories that we are coming with are not just of our own, but are carried from many generations before us. And so as that is happening, I also want to acknowledge the land that I am on, which is Chumash and Tongva territory, known today as Long Beach, California. Uh, Dr. Aparnas is calling my grandmother. She was an Ayurvedic healer. And also, if you're feeling called to share, um, tell me where your ancestors are from without telling me exactly where they're from. And uh, I'd love to give an additional prompt, which is, what is it that you are celebrating about yourself today? Because we are in a society where we are so under-celebrated, where we tend to dwell on the things that aren't working, especially for those of you who come from higher education. We are inundated with messages that, uh, that we may not be doing good enough, or I know for myself as a student, I felt like my, my intellect was measured by my grades. Maybe some of you struggled with that as you were going through those loops yourself. And so what would it look like for us to cultivate a culture where we open up with celebrations? And um, in my programs, um, and maybe many of you are familiar with this practice, I open up with a rose, a bud, and a thorn. And so with the rose, it's like, when we celebrate ourselves, what gets celebrated gets repeated and amplified. And I've begun to do this at the end of my day as a ritual as well, versus dwelling on the things that went wrong and what I could do better the next day, just holding space for at least at least three things that I get to celebrate about myself. Maybe that celebration is I showed up today. That celebration is I called my mom and I said hi. That celebration is, I actually took myself out for a walk. It doesn't have to be a grand celebration, but starting to take notice of the ways that sometimes we overly criticize ourselves or that we're so quick to offer feedback to others without first taking a moment to celebrate them. Reading in the chat, calling my grandmother and all of my ancestors from the islands of Fiji, living off the sea and the land who taught me to share love through food and memories. Yes, fried catfish and hush puppies. Lemon Cleo, who came from the sweet Magnolia and lush Mississippi River, calling in great grandparents from the land of spicy goulash. Beautiful. Woman ancestors from lands of salty air, those from the past I know of struggle and love, and those from the times and places I do not know who have gifted me with their grace and strength, land of white sage and fire. And I feel like I'm already about to put together a poetry book with some of these responses. I love it, I love it, I love it. And so this ties into what my medicine is. So, um, but before we go into that, I wanted to set an intention for our time together. Oh, and also if you're feeling called to celebrate yourself, uh, let me go ahead and share my slideshow. That way, for those of you who are more visual learners, you can follow me through here. All right. So today's workshop, Dreaming as Strategy, Envisioning Ourselves as Future Ancestors. And so, again, my name is June Marissa Kausith, also known as Juma K. Gender pronouns are she, her, hers. And my medicine is supporting change makers, visionaries, uh, and, and solutionaries with being able to tell their story, connect with their ancestors, and birth their sacred offerings. And I'll go into more of what a solu solutionary is. Um, and something that I'm celebrating about myself today is that I made it here and that I'm, I'm currently here at my parents' home uh, because um, my mother has been in recovery and I am celebrating that she is still here, that she's getting better. And so my highest intention for our time together is that you move forward 
with a greater trust in your dreams as a blueprint toward possibilities and for you to cultivate a deeper relationship with your ancestors, which is already happening by us calling them in and even just reminiscing on where it is our ancestors are from beyond the lands that were probably named by colonizers. And if not, then we hold those names so, so, so sacred. And uh, a big part of my work as a storytelling coach and a self-proclaimed life doula that supports people with rebirthing their own stories and lives is getting people to share their stories because shame dies in places where our stories are shared. And so we get to compost any old narratives that may be holding us back into stepping into the, the ancestors that we have been praying for uh, and fertilizing them into new growth. And so one of the things that I also love to do in many of my workshops is inviting people to ask themselves, like, what are the stories that you may be telling yourself that are holding you back from being able to share your own story? Because while my medicine is being able to support people with um, with, with getting clear on the story that they want to share with the world, none of those stories matter if we are not first and foremost working with the stories that we are telling ourselves. And so you are in the right place if your stories of victimhood and oppression have been holding you back and you're ready to release this pain by divorcing from the struggle to marry something greater. You're also in the right place if you maybe have been questioning who are my ancestors, you've been feeling that disconnect, you're questioning what your higher purpose is, maybe you're in your higher purpose now um, and you're craving to be in community with others on a similar path of building their legacies while uh, being in a culture where we are celebrating and uplifting one another along the way, while also seeing feedback as a gift. Um, if you're here, perhaps you are seeking to expand beyond nonprofit and higher education, higher education or freelance work by exploring alternative economies that can center around your story. And also you feel in your bones that there is a healer within your lineage and you're excited to reconnect with that part of yourself by becoming the one that you've been praying for. And so uh, who it is that lights me up to work with, I love, I love playing with people who identify as radical healers, or maybe you are a radical healer and you just don't know yet. Uh, you are a creative. And what is a solutionary? Somebody who's ready to break the cycles of intergenerational trauma and scarcity within their own lineage. And I believe that scarcity is actually a byproduct of white supremacy and colonialism that has made us believe that there isn't enough joy, there isn't isn't enough abundance, there isn't enough pleasure to go around. We're not here to compete. We're actually here to amplify each other. Solutionary is a term that I learned from ancestor Grace Lee Boggs and actually like wrote a little ditty for this project I was in several months ago. It goes, I'm a solutionary, a revolutionary. What's breaking down? I'm building up. We cannot be buried. I'm growing through the concrete and nothing's gonna stop me because I'm a seed and I am rooted in community. And so, so much of my joy comes from music, comes from dance, comes from poetry. And I believe that like that's how I want to go down in the revolution. And so what exactly is radical healing? Um, the ways that I've come to understand it while also giving credit to, um, I don't know the, the if, if there's a specific person who came up with this term, but I do want to acknowledge many of the Black healers that came before me, like Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde, that were already embodying this. And so for me, uh, radical healing includes storytelling, includes art, it includes seeing a, a, a vision of us moving from self to collective care, to where we remember that if racism is 500 years old, then we have ancestral wisdom that transcends thousands and thousands of years beyond that. And where we are in a place of remembering our medicine, remembering our magic, reclaiming the medicine of our ancestors and acknowledging the root causes 
of trauma, but not allowing these oppressive narratives to dictate the future that we are co-creating together. Now, what is it that we can expect from today? Um, a little glimpse into my story medicine. I'll guide us into a visualization of connecting with ourselves as future ancestors, a little bit of time for journaling and reflection, and then an invitation for how we can continue this journey together if you are feeling called to do so. So as I was reflecting on the story that I was going to share, um, yeah, well, first of all, what I will say is that what many people may know about me is that I've done a TED Talk called How to Connect with your ancestors that is, I think at currently like 40,000 views and counting. Um, I run a successful coaching business that predominantly serves women of color as well as allies uh, with being able to uh, find clarity in their message and confidence in their speaking so that they can share their story, grow their legacy and heal generations before and after them. Uh, I'm also published in a best-selling book called woman of color who boss up and I um, I am a byproduct of the Cal State system. I graduated from Cal State Long Beach, probably stayed there much longer than I should, but it's because of my insatiable curiosity about the world and I just could not figure out what it is to major in. <laughs> and so I eventually graduated with uh, communication and theater arts. And while I am so proud of these accomplishments today. What I am most proud of is being able to cultivate a legacy where I feel like I don't need to hide any parts of myself. Uh, one where I can be in joy, where I can wear bright colors, where I can like come onto these calls and just like share a little bit of poetry and song and feel like it is safe uh, because it wasn't always this way. Uh, it was just five years ago where I was working um, at a domestic violence agency and my 60 hour weeks, as well as 1.5 hour commutes would consist of me being on crisis hotline calls woman calling me saying, I'm just looking for shelter. I'm just looking for safety. And while I would get many of the same folks calling over and over again, sometimes what it is they needed to hear the most was like, you are worthy, you are safe. Um, and in addition to that, I was also doing community organizing here in Long Beach um, with the responsibility of getting community members uh, in the Southeast Asian community, more particularly Cambodian, Laotian, Thai, uh, with talking about ways that we can um, explore violence prevention that didn't involve calling the 1 800 number. But instead, what happened is that as I would go to these community meetings, uh, and really what we call it today is transformative justice, right? I would go to these meetings. Uh, what would happen is that the elders would come to me and they would say, well, I, I don't, I don't, um, I just want to talk to you. And so nobody really wanted to talk to each other. And so then I just became like this magnet for other people's stories and their traumas. And, um, and even when I would encourage them to call our 1-800 number um, at the time, like they, they just didn't want to do it. And so um, I started to realize as well that there was a gap in the ways that we were attempting to do violence prevention work because um, as I was working in a direct service organization, um, we weren't talking to community-based organizations. We weren't talking to uh, the labor rights organizers. We weren't talking to uh, the housing rights organizers. And so then I would start going to these other meetings with organizers to, to just like, 
ask them about how they can be a resource to us only to find that they needed me as a resource because they were struggling with getting their um, their own community members to come to the meetings at times because of uh, maybe intimate partner violence that was happening at the homes. And so uh, what unfolded as a result is that I got called into an emergency meeting. And um, from there, uh, I remember the stories going on in my head. Oh my gosh, like what's gonna happen? Am I in trouble? Um, and things already didn't feel in alignment because of the ways that I was choosing to disrupt the system by wanting to engage um, so intimately in community. Um, and I remember thinking to myself as well, I can no longer work for an organization <laughs> that claims to perpetuate or that that um, that perpetuates the 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 very same things it claims to fight against. And uh, on that beautiful day is when uh, uh, the last words that were shared with me were, you're a free spirit. You can just go and be free now. Um, yeah, and the incongruency was how um, I wasn't meeting the deliverables on paper, <laughs> but um, I was like just embodying and breathing this in my everyday life to the point where it started to even disrupt my personal life. Um, and I'm curious to hear from you, um, like, well, like we, we tend to believe that in order for us to be in liberation to uh, to to do restorative work um, and to like change these systems that it means that we have to sacrifice our own wellness our own joy or that for us to experience joy and pleasure that it maybe takes away from others like who am i to feel joy who am i to feel pleasure um, who am i to choose another way when so many people around me are suffering. I'm curious if this has ever been your story before, where maybe you have held yourself back from envisioning an alternative, uh, maybe because like there, there tends to be feelings of guilt or shame when it comes to uh, just like envisioning something that goes beyond the narratives of oppression. So let me know, give me a one in the chat if that's you. I can't see people's stuff. So um, if our moderators can let me know if folks are engaging, that would be so amazing. Hmm, let's see, I'm seeing in the chat, can't fight a war on two fronts, both professional and professional. Personal, no more of that. Hmm. Yeah, and so um, what happened afterward is that I ended up becoming a transformative justice consultant to where I just decided I'm going to work directly with community outside of these institutions. Um, and I started doing workshops um, throughout Southern California uh, at the time with an incredible organization called Creative Interventions. Um, if any of you are familiar with Mimi Kim and her work. And so she really took me under her wing uh, to hold these dialogues. But something that I noticed is that uh, the people we would attract were fellow community organizers, um, educators as well, with these big hearts of wanting to help their own community and their family. And yet, oh, the heaviness I would feel at times from people's hearts uh, around trying to strategize how, like, what, what, what is, I need the plan. Give me the strategic plan on how to stop violence in my community. And I would feel the grief as well. And so uh, I started asking myself, who are we to even hold space to show up in community when when there's like when we ourselves are not are not making space for restoration. We're not making space for healing. We're not making space to feel joy because 
because for many of us, especially for those of us who um, come from marginalized identities, maybe, maybe you are a child of immigrants, maybe you witnessed your parents working multiple jobs uh, to where maybe you haven't had an example or an embodiment of what rest and pleasure can look like and what it can feel like to the point where when when it is introduced into your body that it can feel like a threat pleasure and rest can feel like a threat when when we have been so caught up in fight or flight our whole lives and so i also realized that what called me to this work was my own stories of being uh, somebody who whose body was was touched before I even knew what consent was. What drew me to this work was witnessing the long hours my parents would work and not wanting to see them suffer. What drew me to this work was experiencing the weight of suffering on the world on my shoulders and feeling like it was my responsibility to alleviate it to the point where my body completely shut down. And that's exactly what happened. My body shut down. And as much as I wanted to keep fighting, as much as I wanted to continue doing community work, my body is like, you know what, if, if you're not going to sit down, I'm going to go ahead and do it for you. And also, um, so synchronistic that at that time, I was going through a trauma informed yoga teacher training with another one of the speakers who was on this panel, Susanna Barkataki. And even though I went into that training with the intention of teaching yoga to community members uh, who were uh, healing from sexual trauma, I realized that I had never given my body to heal from my own stories and it manifested in my womb space it manifested in my hips and i remember feeling like who am i to go to the doctor when i want to explore these alternative healing practices and one of my mentors at the time uh, said to me june we are not here to do this work against these institutions we're here to work alongside them so go to the hospital um, and so when i connected the teachings of yoga into what was happening in my body i realized it was my root chakra my sacral chakra our root chakra it exists between our hips um, and our sacral chakra is our reproductive system and so all of that became inflamed and so maybe some of you uh, uh, might be experiencing uh, sensations in the body, stagnation, which really are symptoms of stories that we may be unknowingly carrying that are from our childhood or from our ancestors, from our parents that were passed down. And the ways that it manifests is, is in how our body attempts to communicate with us to be still, to slow down, to chill out, which is really challenging when we're living under capitalism that's telling us our worthiness is measured by our productivity. And so I just had to start saying no to everything. And it took two weeks. And from there, went to see a doctor. Doctors like, we can't find anything wrong with you. And everything that was happening in my body naturally dissipated. And so what happened as a result, I decided, you know what, I am going to just experiment pouring into me for at least a year and, 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 and see where this goes. Uh, I ended up joining a pole dancing studio, which was very interesting. And I uh, was a work study intern there. I collected uh, my unemployment checks at the same time. So I pretended like I was getting paid for being there. But, um, oh my goodness, the stories that surfaced from, from the people who came here, the stories of their own healing, it was the first time where I had ever felt at home in my body. And I'm not saying you need to go and sign up for a pole dance studio, by the way, but what is it that you are doing in your life to tend to other parts of your body beyond us just uh, living in our heads? How often are you tending to 
your hips, to your womb, to your feet. Um, and so this has become a liberatory practice for myself every single day. There needs to be celebration and also celebration of my body and how far it's come. And so in addition to uh, this new movement practice that has brought so much healing into my life, I got curious about how it is my ancestors healed themselves prior to 1-800 numbers and hospital visits. And that's what brought me back to my ancestral homeland, where, as was shared in the bio, I uh, studied with a traditional midwife who taught me that our ancestors, the only tools that they had were their hands and their heart. And considering the criminalization of midwifery for many indigenous communities, uh, a little backstory on that is that in the in, in the I think it was like the 80s or the 90s. Um, and I can only speak for Thailand, though I know that this is something that has happened across the globe. The government uh, mandated that village midwives were required to go through a certification process if they wanted to continue sharing this medicine in their communities. And most of these midwives, these traditional healers, they couldn't read they couldn't write. And so while they had this practice that has been passed down for thousands and thousands of years, if they, if they were to continue sharing this medicine, they would be punished for it. And so this has been the discord in so many of us in our own connections with our ancestors, the shame of feeling like, because I can't read or write, because I can't pass a test, maybe I'm not smart enough. And so my teacher was one of the very few midwives that actually passed the exams. And so her medicine is, is this self-preservation, which I was so grateful to receive a little glimpse of. And also the greater medicine is that when I came home from that trip, um, that's when my mother revealed to me, like, she's like, why did you go to Thailand when you could have just asked me, you know, that your grandmother or her grandmother, my great grandmother was a midwife, right? And I used to help her all the time. I'm like, what? What? And I hope that this is also inviting you to um, start like, just thinking about what are the stories that my elders uh, don't realize is actually worth sharing because had I not led with curiosity and dreaming, this story would have stayed stuck in my mother and she would have brought it to her grave and I would have never known about this part of my lineage. And so actually it was on my 30th birthday where there was a training happening for doulas of color. Uh, I was invited to facilitate a workshop on Thai traditional healing. And I remember thinking to myself, who am I? Who am I to talk about this when I can barely speak the language? Uh, when I was only in Thailand for like a month um, and I'm, I'm still figuring this out. And so I invited my mom to come with me. And she said to me, I won't speak very much because my English isn't good. Instead, she showed up with a basket full of herbs, galangal, ginger, turmeric that she gathered from her backyard as well as her friend's backyard. And it was the first time in that circle of other women of color who were feeling this calling to reconnect with their own ancestors' medicine, where I, for the very first time, learned about how I came into this world, how I was cut from the umbilical cord, how my mother birthed me alone in a hospital room while my father was away at work. And within two weeks, she was already back on the hospital floor working as a nurse because she had to provide for the family. All eyes in the room just had tears streaming down their cheeks. And she said, why is it that you are crying? Life is suffering. This is normal. And that's when I turned to her and I realized, wow. I get it now. I'm carrying your stuff. Prior to that day, she told me, uh, don't have children. It only brings suffering into the world. 
But after that day, she said, when you are ready, I will be your doula. <laughs> because when she grew up in the village, um, nobody ever birthed alone. They were surrounded by loved ones, by family, and were given at least, at least 60, 90 days to heal as other people in the village would bring food and herbs to ensure that this reincarnated ancestor, this child, my spiritual practice of Buddhism, uh, would be tended to, would be cared for as um, a teacher. And so while today I'm not a birth doula, uh, though I have done two births, which I'm like, okay, I'm apocalypse ready, y'all, kind of. I still want midwives and doctors around. <laughs> If anything, allow my energy to be the medicine. Uh, today, I love to um, identify as a self-proclaimed life doula that is just so passionate about supporting others with remembering, remembering their ancestral wisdom, with preserving their stories. And if they're feeling called to do so, to cultivate a legacy from that. Um, so thank you. Thank you for being here to receive my story today. Um, I love for this to be like conversational. So I'm kind of sad that I can't see what's coming up in the chat. But if there's anything that spoke to you about parts of my story, uh, just know that that is so, so welcome. Um, because what I would love to transition into is for you to dream and to see where these dreams take you. Um, so we'd just like love to open it up, though, for anybody to share anything that may have been coming up on their hearts with my story medicine. Thank you, June. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate you being here today. And as we move to Q&A, hello, everyone. I am Mo Miller and um, she, her pronouns. I am your AVP lecturer, Sal, and tri chair of the Women's Caucus. Today, I am wearing... Um, well, I have curly salt and pepper hair. I'm wearing my glasses today because I'm a little tired. And I'm wearing my smart, funny, and black t-shirt today. Yesterday was Wu-Tang. Today is smart, funny, and black. And we're going to go ahead and move into our Q&A portion of um, the session. And oh, please oh, post um, oh. Uh, yeah. No, so, so actually, I just wanted to open up. To, well, I still want to take people through the visioning. Oh, uh, well, let me get yeah, that yeah. off so, and then yeah, yeah, that's back, so, I, uh, I just wanted to, about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wanted to open it up to 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 just like share like uh, if there's if there's any comments that came up or, or like any reflections, mm. um, well, intersections. Oh, Dr. can I model? Can yes, I model yes, if we don't absolutely. get any? Because a lot of things really um, hit home for me in this space, being that we're academics. Mm -hmm. And as academics, we feel we need to work to death. Yeah. And um, so when you said um, shame dies in places where assurances aren't there, and that feedback as a gift really hit home because we are, we go through this process of RTP, you know, it's called, um, what is it, retention, tenure, and promotion. And it's this file you put together and your colleagues give you feedback that sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not. So this idea of feedback as a gift really hit because it would be nice to get feedback as a gift <laughs> instead of a criticism on the way I do my work that sometimes you don't jive with because you don't have my point of view. So I really, um, can you, oh, I guess the thought would be, can you expand on how do we bounce back from those type of criticisms where the yeah. feedback is not a gift? It's outright criticism. Yeah. And that's why I emphasize on creating more space for celebration because we're so under celebrated. And so the ways that um, I love to give feedback is I actually love to open it up with, with at least three things that I see about this person. And their, and, and their beauty so that um, when I transition into the feedback, it's never about the individual, it's more so maybe about the situation. And, and it's like, um, if it lands, take it. And if not, then that's completely okay too. Um, and so what would it feel like for you to actually have a culture of celebration 
like Mo, what, what, what I'm celebrating or what I see in you, this is another beautiful practice. What I see in you is because when we forget our own magic, when we forget our own medicine, the beauty of having community is that we can borrow that belief others have in us. And I don't think that we're reminded enough about that. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. In our comment section, um, our sister Tracy Salisbury, she posed, how do you break the habit of overworking yourself, not looking after oneself? It's hard not to feel guilty about saying no, even though you know you should particularly when it comes to working with students who need you so much. Mm. Yeah. So let's do this um, because I have a feeling a lot is going to come up in the q and I'd like to take us on a journey of envisioning ourselves as ancestors. Um, because I feel like it's so easy to beat ourselves up about what are the things I'm doing wrong versus what is, what, what, what is something that I did today that is worth celebrating, that maybe think something that usually triggered me, I didn't react to it like I, uh, how I would normally. Um, and maybe the celebration is like you actually like I said, you showed up today. Um, so if it's okay, if you're comfortable doing so, um, I'm going to share my audio. And if you are in a place where you can ground yourself uh, in a seated position, I'd love to invite you to close your eyes or to keep it neutral. And I invite you to take the longest, deepest inhale that you have taken all day. Breathing in through your nose, taking your time, allowing your breath to travel up your nostrils to the crown of your head, holding it for a moment. And don't do a quick exhale, but just gently release it as you feel any tension in your body melting into the earth. We tend to hold this tension in our jaws, by the way, dropping the tongue from the roof of our mouth as well as exploring where there's tension in our neck and in our shoulders and bringing awareness into our belly or our womb space, if that's what you'd like to connect with. Even for folks who don't have a womb, you bring your attention there. And also feel the energy from your feet as you are being guided by our first mother, Mother Earth. And as you inhale in, you can invite a smile to your face and exploring any shifts that happen in the body, even with this subtle sensation alone. And you can also, just reflect on one thing that you are celebrating about yourself today. Celebration for being here. Celebration for not giving up, especially your dedication to students, to your legacy, and also celebrating the journey that it took for you to be here because we tend to forget that there is a version of yourself that prayed for who you are today. That younger version of yourself who wasn't even sure whether or not they would get into school wasn't even sure what their career path would be. They would even get paid for it. And here you are existing as your wildest dream come true. And so just for a brief moment, if you could envision that version of yourself that maybe was like 
oh, stressing about, am I going to pass this test? Am I even going to graduate? Maybe you had to go through school alone. Your parents weren't able to be as supportive. Whatever the stories were, just witness that time of your life. Maybe one of the students sitting in the seat is actually that younger version of you, the one full of self-doubt and worry. Do I even belong here? And if you could share with them words of wisdom, what would those words be? You are enough. I'm proud of you. You've got this. And so tuck them into your heart. Because while it could be so easy for us to stress about where we're not, what we have not accomplished, just know that if you in this present moment exist already as a dream come true, that there is a future version of yourself as well that is eagerly cheering you on from the other side of all of your fears and your self-doubt. And so now I invite you to envision yourself as an elder, an elder with silver hair and uh, and wrinkles that tell stories of how much you were able to smile and laugh throughout your life. And you're getting ready to go home. Imagine yourself in a place that feels like a portal for you into peace. Maybe it is the land where your ancestors come from. And if you don't know where that is, reminiscing on a place that makes you feel like home. How does it smell? What do you see around you? Really feel it in your body. Perhaps you are surrounded by lavender, flowers, sky, water. Maybe you're just sitting on your porch, reflecting on a life that was well lived. And so as you are here, just looking back, you just say to yourself like, wow, never in my life did I imagine that I would, I would accomplish such things that I would have been able to serve hundreds of students. But really, it's the numbers that don't matter. It's it's the impact. Never in my life did I imagine that I would be able to see the places that I have, travel to the places that I dreamed of. And so just give yourself permission to dream about the things that you were able to, uh, to, to manifest in your life. And then now reflect on the faces you were able to touch. And so imagine now that the people whose stories you've been able to tenderly care for, maybe in your classrooms or in the organizations that you were a part of, they show up to your graduation. Maybe they bring their children or their grandchildren and they come to offer their gratitude. Thank you. Because of you, I what? How is it that you were able to make an imprint on someone's life?
what are the stories that they share about you and how it is you chose to show up in this lifetime? What kind of friend were you, sibling, parent, coworker, neighbor, or mentor? How did you contribute while you were here? And how did you make this a better place to live for all? And so I invite you to just like even say that to yourself, like, thank you, thank you. Because of you, I was able to embody a new story for my life. Because of you, I knew that I had a place. Because of you, I now know I belong. And so feel that in your body. And the last person that shows up is somebody who reminds you of you, and that's present day you. But they come to you concerned about, I, I'm not quite sure if I'm doing things right. And you smile back at them. What are the words of wisdom that you would impart upon them? So I'll give you a moment to just sit with your future self. Receive these words. Place a hand on your heart, another over your belly. As you feel this version of yourself merge into who you are today. And as you feel your hands on your body, we also feel the hands of those that came before us. Maybe the ones who weren't able to pursue their dreams, who didn't have as many choices, who maybe weren't able to speak up. And you feel this younger version of yourself that thought that who you are today was just a quote unquote dream. But here you are as your ancestors' wildest dreams come true. In spite of everything it is you have gone through and that you are going through, how is it that you can hold so tenderly to this vision knowing that as we are here sharing this space together, we are planting seeds for a legacy that we may not even be able to see in our lifetime. But one day, we will be an ancestor on somebody else's altar. And if you do not have an altar, just know that the most important altar to care for is you your body. And so in this moment, I invite you to make a commitment of how you will care for this altar, how you will commit to showing up as a good ancestor, how is it that you will cultivate the village How will you be a resource to your community? Especially in one where society tells us that these resources are lacking. Take another breath in. And just know that we are expecting unfinished business here. This is more than just an hour and a half workshop. This is a lifetime, many lifetimes in the work. When you're ready, you can rub your heart and just say, thank you, body. I so appreciate you. You can bring your left hand over your right shoulder, your right hand over your left shoulder, feeling your heart beat against your chest, giving yourself a nice butterfly hug 
rocking back and forth. And then if you're feeling called to do so, using your hands to explore any parts of your body where there's stagnation or tension, because all of that is just our body saying, hey, hey, <laughs> it's been a while. Can, can, can I get some love over here? <laughs> and then you can open up your arms, open up your heart and your throat. And our heart literally emanates a magnetic frequency that extends uh, at least, what, eight to 10 feet. And so none of this work as a revolutionary, as a change maker matters if we are not tending first to our own hearts, finding compassion for ourselves, allowing ourselves to feel it from our toes to our crown, and then letting that be the ripple to what it is we want to see in the world. And I will leave you with words of wisdom from uh, Wielding the Force, the Science of Social Justice. If we really believe that capitalism is unsustainable, then we also must believe it does not require much assistance to collapse it will collapse under its own weight. We must act with the courage and faith of our convictions. Yes, we must protect life and draw lines in the sand to ensure survival and well-being now. But what will come after capitalism's collapse if we are not prepared with healthy, sustainable, community-based alternatives? Who will create the new and better world if we, who have achieved a level of relational consciousness, don't start on our beliefs. Besides, don't these alternatives in and of themselves contribute to the demise of a poisonous and violent system? Personally, I want to be nurturing life when I go down in the struggle. I want nurturing life to be my struggle. Hmm. We can slowly return, allowing those words to just settle into our body, our breath, and our being. Um, and to carve out some time for yourselves to not rush to the next thing. I believe that words cast spells and spelling is the spell. And so you actually have some of these prompts already. It should be in the journal that was gifted to you from CFA. And to continue to revisit this and ask yourself, how did I show up as a good ancestor today? And um, that is what I want to leave you with. Uh, and as promised, for those of you who um, want to continue this journey, uh, I have a guided meditation that actually I, I, I switched it up um, this morning because I, as I was thinking about the people who are in this space, I'm like, ooh, let's call upon ancestors like Grace Lee Boggs, uh, Yuri Kochiyami, uh, Kochiyama, um, Audrey Lord, Bell Hooks, Thich Nhat Han. And so if you go to bit.ly slash ancestors in the making, you will see that um, you will get my uh, revolutionary chakra aligned alignment meditation that calls upon these ancestors uh, and then you will get um, five days of you getting to know me more me wanting to get to know you um, and and of course like updates on upcoming ways that you can continue deepening this journey alongside me and you can always unsubscribe please don't be on it if you know you don't want to get the meditation and allow that to be a resource for you so thank you so much. Um, I'd love to just like open it up now to some Q&A or just anything that's on your heart that you want to share. Um, and I'm so grateful that you showed up today. And we are grateful for you being here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm going to go in the Q&A and um, give you some comments that I want to make sure you receive. Um, Christina Costa said, the medicine I received today was that academia will never love me. 
and my ancestors because it was built on and continues the project of colonialization. Even in my discipline of ethnic studies, there is still that coolness that is anti um, detectable to building community. I've never seen that word before, so excuse me if I pronounced it wrong. I will stop looking to be filled by it. I need to write more poetry and connect more with my community outside of academia. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I resonate with that. Yeah, and, and uh, I'm going to offer an invitation. What if you replace the word need with choose? Or I'm excited to, only because um, I often like to reflect on what are the words that are creating a contraction in my body. And as somebody who loves to break rules, if somebody tells me I need to do something, um, I'm going to probably not do it. <laughs> and so um, and so just just explore how that feels in your body instead of like I need to write poetry. It's like I choose to. I'm excited to. And then also look for communities that can help to cultivate that practice, which Las Takoras is one resource that came on here. Um, and I absolutely love, love, love your reflection. Thank you. Jamie um, said, thank you so much. It's beautiful, inspiring, meaningful. I love that because it is. It, it, it's, um, um, I'm resonating with you bringing us to a place of a deep, deep, like we just rooted out, you know, when you said, now you're, you prayed for yourself already. And I immediately remembered that little girl that I was who had all hopes and dreams and that grandmother who education is key. Education, that would be the one ancestor who would be like, girl, I can't believe you know, got up to the college and <laughs> teaching what, you know, of all things, you know, so that for me, I could see that resonating. So Yeah, and, um, and something I want to celebrate about all of you is that maybe we're telling ourselves the story of, oh, great. Well, like, what was the point of me going through higher education if like writing poetry or dancing or singing or wanting to do that kind of work? It's like, I, I didn't need a degree for that. But guess what? You are able to enter and access spaces that people like me may not be able to because I don't have that higher credential or that your ancestors and so let's just celebrate that. And so now in, in, in our time together is all about you remembering why it is you chose to enter these institutions in the first place. Just don't forget. <laughs> just don't forget. And in, in this space of academia, you can forget. Yeah. Um, um, Sharon, when you were sharing your story, um, Sharon had posted that uh, your story reminded her of how she had to break the law when I had a midwife for her first child home birth and for her second child I had to put her in a front pack and carry her to work when she was three days old. Um, but she didn't feel like she was suffering. It was joyful having a new life to care for. Yeah. Man, that, Thank you for I, sharing that. I, yes. Yeah. I, I, that, I, I'm about to cry. <laughs> yeah. And I just, oh, I love to say good. tears, tears are the body's way of saying thank you. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes we find ourselves apologizing for our tears when really tears are our are, are, are prayer. They're, they're messages that are saying, like, thank you for releasing this because you've been holding on to this for so long. So mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. absolutely no shame in that either. No, none at all. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Um, back to our sister Tracy, um, who has a daily struggle um, sleeping, you know, it's a daily battle. I feel like some of us in academia are like that. Just like I kind of have a suspicious, we, including myself, sleep with night guards <laughs> to mm -hmm. keep us from grinding. Uh, grinding. Yeah, when you did the butterfly hug, I immediately recognized it. And I immediately went to my jaws because yeah. that's where most of my um, stress is. Um, mm -hmm. Any tips or you know, not only say tricks, but like tips or strategies for getting a good night's rest? Mm, I mean, I am a, an advocate for plant medicine. <laughs> so that's just like, I'm like <laughs> reclaiming ancestors medicine. That's one. <laughs> but, 
but outside from that, you know, I just, I can only reflect as somebody who once was inside of these institutions um, and celebrating those who choose to stay in there um, to, to do this work from the inside is that oftentimes uh, it's like the, the ways that we frame self-care is like, oh, if you're burnt out, go and restore yourself and then come back. But what is the point of that if you're returning to a culture that refuses to embody collective care and collective wellness? Um, and so, uh, like, I, I, I mean, how is it that you are making you are you are making room for pleasure and joy outside of academia? Yeah. And are you hiring yourself to do that? Because part of my work as, um, as a coach is like, I literally invite my, my students to, to put it in their calendar as if it's a work hour. And so this is something mm -hmm. that all of you can try, by the way, look at your calendar and ask yourself, how much of my time am I actually giving away? Where is it that I'm actually blocking out time for me? Yeah. What would it look like if you revolved your calendar around your wellness versus the other way around, literally putting it in your calendar and the ways that, that I would um, encourage you to label your calendar is with the intention. So for example, let's just say morning ritual. And I wouldn't do like 6 a.m. to 6.30. I would do like a, a chunk of time, like manage your task more than the time. And instead of seeing it as a task, see it as an intention. So maybe 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. It could be um, caring for my vessel. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give another tip because for me, like since a lot of my work revolves on how um, our, all of our ancestors were entrepreneurial, for those of you who you know, are, are, are working and, and maybe you're, you're dreaming about ways to create a legacy outside of that, um, the times that you do show up, for work, you can label as your investor. They're investing in your dreams. And maybe your dream is to just travel. That's okay too. Come up with, uh, with a vision that you have for the community, which I believe all of us probably have, but also don't forget to have a vision for yourself. It can be something that's so radically selfish. Like actually my vision is to be at home more with my family. My vision is to have more home cooked meals. My vision is to be able to like go to yoga in the middle of the day if I feel like it. And then start actually putting it into your calendar with an intention. And the reason why I say intention is because a lot of us will beat ourselves up if we don't um, like do things on time. It was just an intention. And if you've got to shift your calendar, that's fine. And to begin actually looking at your year in seasons, it's also mm -hmm. something that I teach in the ways that we can decolonize time uh, because our ancestors didn't work year round either. They sure didn't. They sure didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I actually like, I'm like wintertime restoration. That's my, that's my, um, what you call New Year's resolutions. I do them in the winter when winter solstice hits. Yeah. That's when, the, that's when the Fae, I, I consider myself Fae. <laughs> yes. I, I go rest because it's winter so me and the nymphs and the witches we all rest yes <laughs> so yeah, yeah oh Adri adrina says uh my ancestors worked year round <laughs> adrina you want to speak more on that Um, sure. I mean, my, my ancestors were enslaved peoples. They had no choice about their work. My ancestors were sharecroppers. They had to work for their survival. Uh, my ancestors were working poor. They had to work for their survival. My ancestors worked. Um, yeah, they just yeah. had to work. Thank you for acknowledging that. And, and also, there's a story that that also precedes the narrative of enslavement, right? That we get to tap into and how for, for us choosing rest or at least moments of stillness gets to be revolutionary because there are our ancestors who didn't get to have that as much in their lives. And so how is it that we can plant the seeds towards the ancestors that we get to be? The narratives that the ancestors that you're calling forth um, weren't able to embody 
And so thank you for acknowledging that because I know that this work can be extremely complex. Mm -hmm. And it resonates with your statement like pleasure and rest can seem like a threat. Yeah. With what Adrena just said, it just rounds it out for me that pleasure and rest was a threat to our ancestors. Yes. Right. You could you, you just don't know what the day would bring, but you weren't having any pleasure and you weren't resting, right? Because of the, the, of the threat. Um, Leslie Bryant says, your comment, my medicine is, really resonates with her. Um, her medicine is sharing her art with her children, which she's not getting to do right now. And that's probably why she feels sick. Yeah, so something that I, um... I would love for people to do is to like, if you could take your titles out, how is it that you would describe your medicine and the gifts it is that you bring to the world? Um, so I love that. Thank you. I do. And someone asked in the chat, if you can um, retell us the title of your book again. Oh, uh, it's not my book. I was just featured in a book called Woman of Color Who, Who Boss Up. Uh, that was okay, published women, last year. Okay, women of color who boss up. Yeah. Okay. We are um, still in the Q and A portion of our session. Please feel free um, to put yeah. questions in. I would uh, and a prompt that I would love to offer to you, uh, which would be so helpful for me to receive as well, um, are what are the seeds that have been planted for you today, and how is it that you will intend on watering them? I'm writing it down. What mm -hmm. seeds have been planted? Yes. And how do you intend to water? Yeah. Intend to water. Oh yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I'm just like really reflecting on Ad Adrina's comment as well because I know that this is um, like for my like my parents. I saw them work so much, so much. Um, so where like I even though I was raised in a Buddhist household, I was sent to a Christian school because Christian school was the only school that had early morning childcare and um, early morning and late childcare. So I was often the first to get dropped off and the last to get picked up. Um, and I was a very confused child because I remember my teachers at the time telling me that I was gonna go to hell because, or my parents are gonna go to hell. And I've healed a lot with my own spiritual practice around that. Um, and, and because I rarely saw my parents rest, I wasn't taught stillness as much either, but whenever I would go back to Thailand into my mom's village, um, I'd be like, oh my gosh, like, does auntie and uncle just like not work? <laughs> <laughs> but they would work in the fields early in the morning, like, like before the sun would come out and by eight or 9 a.m., they were, I mean, they worked hard um, within the house, but it's just like, they didn't understand how it is we did it here in the West. And so it's funny because today it's like, we're working to get to where they're kind of already at. Um, and I, I love like this, uh, this seed that was planted. I'm gonna make an altar and improve my management of, of wellness and intentions. And for any of you who, so when you um, sign up for the, um, the so bit.ly slash um, um, ancestor in the making, I've also included a, a PDF on how you can uh, begin to create your own altar if you don't have one yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and all you need, if you don't have a picture of an ancestor, you can just write their name down. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be a blood ancestor. It can be a chosen ancestor and then an offering. And treat this altar not as a centerpiece, but as a plant. Like you got to water it, which is why like I have my altar over here and I have a, this little succulent plant. I notice when my altar has been neglected, when the water is gone, I'm like, oh, I got to water my altar. So I literally have a plant to remind myself to show up or this space and to send gratitude to my ancestors because a lot of us will go go to them like asking for what it is we need versus saying thank you first because it gets to be a reciprocal relationship and then also you can put a picture of your younger self on there 
I love that. I um, I you you made me. I think my mom. Um, we re well, my mother and I have had this interesting relationship where we reconnected this past Thanksgiving, and I walk in her home and I thought how fun that she had graduation pictures of my children, her her mother's graduation picture, her graduation picture, my graduation picture, all from high school. I just thought. It's her little altar of, yeah. of us and these generations of, you know, uh, of uh, people who graduated from high school. It was just because I'm first gen college, mm -hmm. but, you know, and it was, it, it was kind of fun to see it. Like, you know, my grandmother heard from high school, but, you know, and she had, it was inter interesting enough. It wasn't my high school picture for graduation. It was my college. And so having that, um, that space, because I, I walked in that space a lot during Thanksgiving break, just to sit with my grandmother, because I didn't know her that well. She was taken from me at a at a young age, and just marinate in the fact that she was even here to pave the way for me. So this this session, this workshop, um, really just rounds it out. You know, where 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 where's that space I need that healing. And how do I make sure that academia doesn't, or the work, or the work, you know, if, or the work, <laughs> stop me from showing up from or being a future ancestor? I think that's a different yeah. um, perspective for me to look at it. Is you know, did did my Angelou know she was going to be an ancestor for us? Did Bell Hooks? Did Nikki exactly. Giovanni? Did any of you know? They just did it, and you know, showed up for us and themselves so that yes. really rounds it out yes i was hoping for more oh wait there's another question let me look yay i was like i'm hoping for them. oh yeah christina acosta she just says i plan to set a um, time aside to heal through writing creatively and being revolutionary wow in my love for our communities as an indigenous woman mm -hmm. i'm gonna just sit for a second mm -hmm. Um, though depending intersectional ties and setting out to resist all forms of oppression, that includes anti-Blackness, gender, class, heteronormativity, citizenship, et cetera. Uh, yes, yeah. yes, Christine, I appreciate it. I really, really do appreciate that. Um, one more it? comment. Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, it says, thankful for the reminder to cultivate a culture of celebration and create a celebration ritual thank yes. you so much for your comment thank june you. thank you so much for being with us today yeah thank you for having me um and if uh and your feedback as well to me is such a gift because i can't claim myself as an expert on this i can only share from my own lived experience and if any of you are feeling called to continue doing a similar practice i do have a workshop which I like to rephrase as a ceremony for the spring equinox on um, how to cultivate a deeper relationship with your ancestors. Uh, I went ahead and put it in the chat if the um, if y'all can share that out with um, our participants. Oh, here we go. Let me share it with everybody. Um, and so if you're feeling called to do so, I would love to see you there. Um, otherwise, I would love to hear also um, if you carve out time just for the meditation that I gifted you. It's a 17 minute meditation. Uh, and if any stories surface for you, um, just know that I am here as a resource and I'm really active on Instagram. So you're welcome to follow me on there too. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for um, your attendance today. We are grateful for you and we hope you've gained um, some insight of how to take care of yourself and to be in touch with yourself.